This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. I don't know if you knew this, but anyone can get the same premium wireless for $15 a month plan that I've been enjoying. It's not just for celebrities, so do like I did and have one of your assistant's assistants switch you to Mint Mobile today. I'm told it's super easy to do at mintmobile.com slash switch. Upfront payment of $45 for three-month plan, equivalent to $15 per month required. New subscribers only. Renew for 12 months to lock in savings. Taxes and fees extra. Additional restrictions apply. See full terms at mintmobile.com. When you wake up well-rested on a great mattress, everything becomes clear. Huh, I do make everything about me. Things you missed when you were tired finally reveal themselves. My passport is in the pocket of the duffel bag I took to Mexico. At Mattress Firm, we know the right mattress matters. We also know that price does too. So if you see a lower price somewhere else, we'll match it. Plus, you get free and fast delivery. Shop in-store or online at mattressfirm.com. The right mattress matters. We'll find yours. Restrictions apply. See store or website for details. Can the power of poetry and spoken word help us to really care about where our food comes from? Can it move us enough to think twice about how those ingredients were grown or the farmers that are doing it? There's loads of farmers that do some really good stuff. A lot of the consumers maybe don't see that, but then that's partly our fault for not really telling the story very well as well. Those consumers are going to buy our food and that food will shape the way that we can manage the land. Getting people to engage with food and ideas for systemic agricultural change can be really difficult. But that is the hope of a major new arts project called We Feed the UK. Ten stories to celebrate custodians of land, seed, soil and sea from all corners of the country. Stories of farms and food producers that show positive solutions to things like climate change, the biodiversity crisis and social justice in the food system. There's no point in us in the environmental sector just talking to one another and breaking down these silos to rise to the urgency of the climate challenge is so critical. We need to bring in the arts because the arts have the power to actually reach completely new audiences and speak to the heart. And I think that there's no better medium for that than poetry. Apathy is such a big barrier and actually hope activates, definitely. Ten spoken word artists from the award-winning organisation Hot Poets have crafted a collection of poems to bring these food producers' stories to life, ranging from black-led growing projects in London and a workers' co-op in Edinburgh to sustainable fishing along the south coast. I'm Jimmy Famarewa, and in today's programme we're going to dive into three of these stories to hear the conversations between food producers and poets and listen to their specially commissioned work. So as this rapper poet who's spent all my life in cities, I knew next to nothing about farming. In fact, my experience on this farm has been very inspiring. You get doom and gloom about farming and all about what are we eating, how's it being made, and I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to get that cheese and pay that bit extra because I'm actually contributing to something. Everybody, whether you're on a farm or whether you're not a farm, can play a bit in making things better, and I thought, I love it. How can poetry change the narrative on food and cut through the doom and gloom. And is that enough to persuade us that food grown from nature-friendly farming is really worth spending our money on? Uh, You've picked us on a good day today because the sun is is shining, it's beautiful, although it's tucked out of the cold wind, but it is a beautiful day today, isn't it? Cumbria's not quite always like this, but we are today. So, first to Cumbria and a dairy farm just outside Kendall. Yeah, so this is our farm, uh, Strictly. I'm the fifth generation of Robinsons to farm here. There's my son, Robert, as well, who's the sixth, and then my dad, Henry, as well. This is James Robinson, whose family has been at Strictly for 150 years. This is much more than just a medium-sized dairy farm. Everything they do is for nature and the environment. The 140 dairy shorthorn cows roam a wild tapestry of grassland, woodland and becks, threaded together by seven miles of ancient hedgerow. Our milk goes down to U Tree Dairies and they then sell it on to places uh, that are wanting organic milk. So pret a is one of their main customers. We also sell quite a bit to St James Cheese as well. So um, yeah, we're, we're getting a good premium on the milk because it's that organic. The decision to convert to organic farming 20 years ago was a way of securing the farm's future. 
The Robinsons now grow more of their own crops for the cows to eat and are free of artificial fertiliser and pesticides. To bring a new perspective on the story of James's farm, he's been teamed up with Testament, a rapper, poet, theatre maker and also a world record breaking beatboxer based in West Yorkshire. Yeah, one of the first places James took me was um, was the back, which is not what I expect to find in a farm. I expect pasture and machinery, but I don't expect to find almost a little oasis of a little magic forest. I was expecting little sprites and fairies to pop out. Um, it, it was wicked. And uh, James very proudly showing me uh, otter droppings. <laughs> <laughs> and actually it was really fascinating, these little amazing little droppings saying, look at all this nature that's returned to what would have been or could have been an industrialised grey zone of just making product. Yeah, the area down there by the Beck Testament, that was sort of started really by my granddad. So that was in the late 1980s. So the pond was kind of created and dug there and from an area that was just a field, just pasture. So that was the first real bit of envir- you know, purely envir- environmental work that we did on the farm. But everything's linked together now. So we've got the pond and the woodland down there. We've got wetland areas linked by these hedges. We've got riparian strips up the side of the becks. Yeah, if you just try and get that whole thing functioning, it's amazing how much uh, nature does come back. I think farmers are in a really unique position that we are able to change biodiversity, habitat, carbon. We sort of hold it in our hands, really, the, the, the ability to do so much good. We can do so much bad as well, if we're not careful. And there's loads of farmers that do some really good stuff. A lot of the consumers maybe don't see that, but then that's partly our fault for not really telling the story very well as well. Individuals don't really want to shout about what they're doing. That's partly it as well. So we need other people maybe, you know, to help tell the story. But we're also awful at listening to the other side as well. And it shouldn't be us and them at all. We're all in this together. Those consumers are going to buy our food and that food will will shape the way that we can manage the land. I think a lot of people, you know, we go to the, the supermarket, pick up a chicken or milk, and we're not really thinking about where it comes from. We're not thinking about the consequences. But the truth is, we don't want to think about it half the time. And it's actually a choice. And that's what I love about what you do, James, is because actually hearing an empowering story that goes, here's some good news, then it's not, oh, I'm scared to dig for information because the information that you've been given is like, oh, here's where the hope is. Here's where the positive, in fact, here's where the future is. We're doing it for tomorrow. So pick up that responsibly farmed product because actually you're, you're ligging for the future. <laughs> I'll just go up this top of this hill here. So as you know, like one of the things that really inspired me on my first day when um, James gave me this tour of this fantastic farm was the activity of ligging. We're hedge laying, that's what we're doing. So our traditional management of hedgerows, we make a cut through the stem of the tree and that's called the lig. Every 20 years we come and we lay them down. The lig. Lines of undergrowth overgrown, tangled with blackthorns, hawthorns, two men standing, pruning misguided branches. It's the son who bends a hawthorn tree towards dad, who chainsaws, then axes. Then the weight of them both, father and son, pull the tree downward, creating a lig. Laying it down, yet still connected to the stump. This vital link looks tenuous, but nature doesn't need much. Life, the sap, will always find its way up. An ancient tradition places these on the cutting edge of a field. Renewed culture of agriculture, from roots to fruits that it yields. These hedgerows become homes for the hedgehog, the vole. Field mouse attracting owls, tree sparrows, black caps, white throats, bugs, butterflies and bees. So pollen and seeds are cast on the breeze. A grandfather ligs, ligs a father, a son. They say love the little stuff and the bigger stuff will come. Sooner than you think, the lig turns green, moss and lichen. And with over 130 species inside them, the hedgerow shows when a barrier can be a corridor. For life to move through, build a hedge, not walls. And if you don't lig, someone asks why? Well, then you're left with a row of trees that would blow over and die. See, to lig is poetry, cutting and bending lines so new life will come. Inking with saplings cross landscapes, collecting carbon, writing with hawthorn, blackthorn and willow, with cursive hand, a trio of landowners with the onus on the land. The lig is up, then they leave to go home, while these seemingly broken trees breathe new growth. That was absolutely fantastic. (laughs) Thank you, that was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant.
Well, you know just what? It wrote, it, it wrote itself because watching the three of you, these are three cool dudes. <laughs> From my end of things, I'm excited because my audience that would come to my shows or whatever, buy my stuff, um, they're not used to hearing stories about farms. And if we're not supporting the people fighting the good fight and farming the good farms, then we're up the creek. And this is a good news story. We can make the difference. It doesn't have to be doom and gloom, but are we willing to support who needs to be supported? Are we willing to put pressure on the right people to make sure we have more stuff like this? The rapper and poet Testament on the hope that poetry can truly change perceptions about farmers' impact on the land. On to our next story from the We Feed the UK project, which takes me to the Wolves Lane Horticultural Centre in the heart of Tottenham in North London. Here, and in a diverse patchwork of urban growing sites across the borough of Haringey, two groups, Black Roots and Go Grow With Love, are empowering communities to grow their own. Their work includes supporting women of African and Caribbean heritage to nurture a reciprocal relationship with local land and teaching practical skills in nurseries and schools. So my name is Sandra salazar -Desso. I am a community horticulturist, farmer, and the founder of a organisation called Go Grow With Love. We're in a big glass house here with a lot of different varied plants. We grow all different crops, but we tend to focus more on African-Caribbean crops. So we grow a lot of callaloo, we grow a lot of pumpkin, we grow a lot of okra, uh, sweet potato. You're clearly responsible for so much. You've got a lot of exciting projects happening. But where does the story begin for you? Yeah, thank you for that. Absolutely. This is not how I looked when I, when I first started. Never did I expect at all what happened to me. I always tell people the first time that I sowed a seed, it changed my life. And it sounds really silly to say something like that. But it did, because I sowed the seeds thinking, OK, this is, you know, I knew this was a new beginning for me and my son and my new family. And then the next week we went back and the seed had grown into something. <laughs> that was magic. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, a few months, a couple of months later, we were able to harvest the big, massive marrow. How would you characterise the relationship that most people in the community had with growing? <laughs> um, big big eye roll there. Yeah, I, I didn't tell anybody what I was doing for years. I kept it really hush-hush wow. because, um, in a way, I was embarrassed because where I came from, city girl, that didn't happen until something happened. COVID happened. Wow. And then everybody wanted to grow food. Mm. And then all of a sudden, those people who I was hiding from... <laughs> And now growing food with me. <laughs> so yeah. a lot happened, yeah. yeah. I guess the barriers into food growing, I mean, for us melanin-rich people in the diaspora who perhaps are missing that connection with the motherland, the food growing aspect in the soil wasn't something that was part of our everyday life. A way that we are able to pass on information, especially ancestry information, is through storytelling communicate mm. our traditions and our cultural approaches and our cultural methods and and then you know we take people on a journey about nutrition and what it actually means mm. to grow your own food and then before you know it you're captured into our world <laughs> <laughs> we've got you there's a lot of conversation about making it a more inclusive and representative space, but the figures are pretty stark in terms of in the UK is 98% white British industry, really. From what you've kind of learned and discovered through your work, what are the best ways forward? Access to land is like obviously the biggest um, obstacle and barrier that we have. But we look at small spaces of land, any little bit of land there is, even if it's a balcony or pot, we encourage people to grow food. What has uncovered to me is that African Caribbean people and melanin rich people have different relationships with the land. The impact that the land has had through the generations because of what was done in Africa and, you know, colonial. So we are having to reshape that relationship with the land and make it more, if I may say so, fun and sexy. <laughs> it's a lot of work and we need more help. We really do. Zena Edwards is a writer, performance poet, musician and creative educator from London. 
She spent time with Sandra, as well as Paulette Henry and Pamela Shaw from Black Roots, to come up with a unique piece of poetry to help us all get a deeper sense of what their work means for this community. And they work the land some more. For a generation of melanated microbiomes, young and vibrant, but disorientated. Crashing along concrete pavements, city-worn and in confusion. In need of cultural fusion. Unification. Slow, calming Caribbean tradition with the conflicting existence of a fast-paced race to assemble a whole face in a strange land on land estranged. So the growing women say, take your time, it's all earth, reclaim, work with us on the land with love. Return the children to soil, to humus, dark bark, clay and bone, mysobacterium vacai, good bacteria, feeding mycelia, Nature's social media, ancient broadcasts of hidden histories of home seed, grain, fruit and root. Before colonial botanists began blowing up the cornerstones of culture, those balanced boulders of indigenous backbones, wisdom brought by boat, by foot, hidden in the dreadlocks and braids of men indigens who protect and heal. The earth's insight in the breast milk of mother storytellers who listen to the speaking scent of land, to the crumbling of soil between fingers. They hold it to the nostrils of teens to teach their taste buds the beginning. Open young eyes to what you have never seen. That is absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. Completely compelling, spine tingling. For you, what are the things that poetry can do and can accomplish. There's something to offer that's helpful in poetry, that's touching, moving, that's for a reason to shift your perspective on things. Just taking a little bit of time, you're giving yourself an opportunity to be enriched Mm. some way, somehow. Did it make you rethink your own connection to growing cultures and these stories? I've really found myself almost falling in love with the earth a lot more. (laughs) No, falling in love with the earth, I'm going to say that proudly. It's a soul-searching journey in some ways, you know, reason for being. I think it's important that we see black and brown people, people who look like us, doing this work and and it not be like, oh, she's a bit weird tree hugger. It's like, no, we've been connected to nature as well for a long time. It's just that we've forgotten some of it or we've been disconnected from some of our cultural traditions of growing and being in nature and being a part of nature. Poet Zena Edwards at the Wolves Lane Horticultural Centre in London. The We Feed the UK project was launched at the beginning of February and over the next year it'll exhibit its 10 stories with accompanying poetry and photography in both urban and rural settings all over the country. For the Gaia Foundation, who's coordinating the project, they hope it can help the public to build a stronger connection to local food. Hi, I'm Rowan Fillimore. I'm co-director of the Gaia Foundation, which has been going for almost 40 years, reviving Indigenous knowledge and biodiversity and working with Indigenous communities around the world. What, in your view, are the issues with the status quo in terms of food production and farming in the UK? So 70% of the UK's land is farmland. The potential for farmland to become the place in which we can actually support biodiversity and sequester carbon and address, you know, so many of the problems that we're facing is actually enormous. A huge amount of the climate crisis can be attributed to agriculture globally. So we have to change. A lot of these food producers are part of this collaboration, a small scale, and will it be more significant to work with bigger farms and bigger producers and really have that ripple effect of influencing them to make these changes to the way that they're farming? 
I think that there's both. I think that we've got a real opportunity here in terms of the medium-sized farms as well could easily be turning regenerative. James Robinson and Stuart Johnson, who are featured from Cumbria and Northumberland in the stories, you know, these are medium-sized farms. They're not actually particularly small scale. And there's nothing to stop that scaling up. I suppose that one thing we would say is perhaps that, yeah, the Gaia Foundation and some of our collaborators would have a vision for a small farm future, agrarian localism that really fosters thriving communities and people are more connected to where their food is grown from. But I don't see why some of the bigger farmers shouldn't be able to use regenerative techniques as a pathway. There's also with regenerative farming, a lot of the time, there's an onus to to say to the customer, okay, you need to pay a premium. How do you overcome that barrier? Is that something that you're quite conscious of? Well, I definitely think that we've become accustomed in the UK and in many parts of the world now to paying far too little for food. I think that we need to readjust and and actually know that good food, quality food could take more of our income. But of course, there are many challenges around the financial side. I mean, one of the other things is, you know, the subsidy system has really benefited the industrial model. There's been a lot of work around true cost accounting in food and farming. If actually you really accounted for the costs of the environment degradation, the impact on health and the NHS when people are eating poor food, and you know, then you actually flip the picture completely of the value of food. And so I think there's a few things at play there that can be done. Rowan Fillimore, co-director of the Gaia Foundation. And whilst a move towards more regenerative farming practices, as endorsed by this project, is now widely seen as a positive development in relation to trying to reverse biodiversity losses, when it comes to reducing the overall carbon footprint of the industry, which farming method is best placed to help is still very much debated. For our last story, I went to visit a small farm in Somerset, which has been dramatically transformed. Fred Price used to grow grain for the commodity crop market, much of it becoming animal feed, and he relied on agrochemicals for a decent harvest. After a lot of soul-searching, he's led a transition on the farm to an agroecology approach. It's now an old-fashioned mixed farm, which integrates livestock to help regenerate the soil. They're also part of an alternative grain economy, growing plants called population wheats, These are, broadly speaking, genetically diverse plants all in the same field, which are able to adapt to changes in climate and disease. Yeah, so the Southwest Grain Network is a collection of growers like myself, bakers like Rosie, Millers, anyone who eats bread. It's a group of people who have come together to reimagine a different kind of grain economy, a grain system where we do grain differently to support the work of farmers farming agroecologically and to ensure seed sovereignty from the seed all the way through to the loaf. Here on Gothelney Farm is an on-site bakery run by Rosie Benson, a flour-dusted outbuilding where the bread is made from grain, 100% of which is grown on the farm. Fred and Rosie's story is being told by the Bristol-based poet, producer, MC and multi-instrumentalist Disraeli. The kind of farmer I am now is, is someone who feels like they're producing food for people compared to nearly two decades ago when I started farming. We put wheat on lorries and we sent it to places we didn't know where it was going at a price we didn't control, and that was pretty disenfranchising. Now I grow food for people who I know, and uh, there's a community of people who are generally local who eat what we grow. And there was a strong push factor as well. I really felt trapped by the commodity system that I was producing for. In in a commodity system as a grower, When you don't control your price and you're so disconnected from your consumer, really there are two levers that you pull. One is yield and the other is scale, which is about reducing cost of production. So I felt really trapped by this, but it wasn't just farming decisions. It was thinking about what kind of food system we were embedded in. I'm Disraeli. I'm a spoken word artist and I make stories. It's really interesting to write commissions like this Mm. that are kind of issues based and about Mm. communicating an idea Mm. efficiently it's not about clever rhyme schemes Mm. it's it's more poetry as a functional tool in Mm. a way Mm. more like a farm tool the story here seems to me to be about turning back to the soil and recognizing the wisdom that's already inherent in the system there's a kind of humility that comes with understanding that i think isn't there do you mind doing like a minute or so of the poem or a section of it 
Fred says, I came back from college with my head alive, chemical agronomy well aligned with everything I wished for, to do what granddad did but better, doubled the yield, tripled the pressure, every plant genetically identical, every solution agrochemical, and so much expense, five years of misery, all work, no breather, until the day I woke with stress-induced alopecia. I stared in the mirror and I saw what I'd been fighting against, my own farm, my own common sense. For once I listened to the seeds. They were asking, what does this land here need? What if we develop a wheat suited to these conditions, which we can't do if we're not allowed to breed? I canceled my contracts and a few of us got together, collected evidence and we lobbied DEFRA. And to our surprise, we got the laws changed. Now we can make our own mistakes, grow our own strains of grains. There is hope here. The power to regenerate the land. There is hope here. The size of a freckle on a hand. There is hope here. The soil still knows what it needs. Hush a minute. Listen close to the seeds. 11 a.m. Cold wind. Young wheat swaying. A winter tree like a brain on a brain stem. And look now in the farmyard, a bakery, and in it, a baker baking, rosy, smiling at the customers she knows each. And those country life can be lonely, but this business thrives on friendships. And they're busy baking sourdough treats with this landscape in. The grains Fred grows, rosy mills right here. And Fred, from the days of being stretched, stressed and scared, where every ghost acre was grounds for despair, clumps falling out. Now his mission animates his soul. He swears by his thick, long hair. He says, there is hope here. The power to regenerate the land. There is hope here. The size of a freckle on a hand. There is hope here. The soil still knows what it needs. Hush a minute. Listen close to the seeds. Wow. That was <laughs> genuinely <laughs> extraordinary. I wonder what it was like for you, Fred. I'm a bit speechless because the Israeli came here for a morning and he's captured... 16 or 17 years worth of my existence <laughs> <laughs> into a couple of minutes. But, I mean, for that reason, I do find it really moving. One of the exciting other stages of drawing all these things together is that you've got Rosie in her bakery right on site here and bits of flour everywhere, but it's a lovely environment. There's the ovens, dough mixer. It's a hub of production, even though it, it's just you, seemingly, today. This is just a loaf of sourdough made with two population wheats and mm. some heritage. It's got some oats and rye in there, so it gives it a softness to the crumb. This is like just out of the oven as Yay. well. Wow, beautiful sourness with the butter. It's really, really great. And that idea of price, you're dealing with a public, and we're all guilty of this, that expects things to be cheap. The basic loaf is 4.25. And I think that is really good value for money, actually. I'm, I stand by that cost yeah. um, in terms of labour hours, in terms of really good ingredients, in terms of how much it satisfies the person that it's feeding. I don't think getting cheaper here is the answer to our problems. It's the biggest systemic problem in terms of how to afford good food and how we can access that. Yeah, I'd like other people to help mm. bring that about. People are hungry for flavour and real food, and I think they're becoming more and more environmentally aware as well and want to support a local food system. So I feel like they're really getting on board with what we're doing here. It's not a hard sell to push good bread. For you, Disraeli, what's the message that you really hope people take away from it? I quite like to address it to the other artists, actually musicians and poets and songwriters. And I think it's really important to remember that we are making the culture and culture makes mindsets. And we can be a part of this change that needs to happen. Let's write the new story. Poet Disraeli. And if you want to hear the full versions of all 10 poems written specially for the We Feed the UK project, you can find them on their website, wefeedtheuk.org as well as find out about where to visit the exhibition at a location near you over the coming year. When you wake up well-rested on a great mattress, everything becomes clear. Huh, I do make everything about me. Things you missed when you were tired finally reveal themselves. My passport is in the pocket of the duffel bag I took to Mexico. 
At Mattress Firm, we know the right mattress matters. We also know that price does too. So if you see a lower price somewhere else, we'll match it. Plus, you get free and fast delivery. Shop in-store or online at mattressfirm.com. The right mattress matters. We'll find yours. Restrictions apply. See store or website for details.